Anytime you're ready, sir, we are ready. set. All right. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Sir Arul Kumaran and his time. I'm not going to cut this time. We are ahead of schedule. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure it's a bit of an anticlimax after cutting the cake to listen to instrumental delivery. Uh, but nevertheless, we should proceed. So the topic which was given is actually current recommendation on instrumental vaginal delivery. But I have given a subtopic here, how to anticipate and avoid trauma because what we are really worried is a good uh, clinical outcome for the mother and the baby. So I would like to start with uh, the Royal College guidelines, which is a little bit old because the latest guideline was produced in 2011. Normally there's an update every three years, uh, but if there is nothing major, then they update it every six years. So the update for this particular guideline has not come up so far. But taking the guidelines, uh, one of the primary things to look for is before we do an instrumental vaginal delivery, we must know whether there's going to be any problem to the mother or the baby. And to, and to see the level or the position and the station of the head. So based on that, the American College uh, definitions are the best. It is adopted by FIGO, WHO and the Royal College. So we'll just have a quick revision. Outlet forceps means the fetal scalp is visible without separating the labia. The fetal skull has reached the pelvic flow. Subtle suture is normally in the anteroposterior position and fetal head is on the perineum. So it's just a lift out forceps we call it. Low is actually the leading point of the skull is plus two, that is from the station, and it, auto it automatically means um, the head is well engaged and abdominally the head will be zero if it's palpable. And uh, the only thing you have to do is actually uh, two subdivisions because it might be low, but it might be in occipital anterior. Very rarely it can be in occipital posterior, occipital lateral, but that is rare in a low cavity force. And most of these also can be easily corrected and delivered. This is the one which causes a little bit more problems to delivery. Uh, fetal head is more than one-fifth palpable per abdomen. The female pelvis, three-dimensionally, is the size of the baby's head at term. So if we take it like a box, the female pelvis, and put the head into the uh, female pelvis, it will occupy the entire pelvis, uh, similar to a 12 weeks pregnant uterus. So the mid-pelvic uh, deliveries means abdominally the head is slightly more palpable and uh, the leading part of the skull is uh, above station plus two, which means between the ischial spine and uh, two centimeters below the spine. So it's a little bit high, but nevertheless can be delivered. And there are two subdivisions there again, like the previous one, a rotation up to 45 degrees or more than 45 degrees. High is above the spine, then we don't really normally do that because the leading part of the bony head is at the spines uh, above, that means the bipartal diameter is even higher than that. So the head will be two-fifths or more above. So if you always think the bony pelvis is the size of the head, if you put and if you can't feel the leading part of the head at the spines, then there is a problem. The next issue with the guidelines is about uh, what are the indications. Presume fetal compromise, and I will just tell the patterns you observe on a CTG, or maternal to shorten and reduce uh, the second stage of labor because they are going into um, have a problem because they have a cardiac disease or a neurological disease or they can't push. So there's a problem with the mother. Here's a problem with the baby, problem with the mother. The third is actually an interrelationship between the mother and the baby. So there is an inadequate progress, which is lack of progress for three hours, a total active and passive phase in the second stage. And if it is without regional anesthesia, it's two hours, so one hour passive and one hour of active phase or one hour of pelvic and one hour of perineal phase. In a multiparous woman, it is two hours with epidural and uh, with regional anesthesia and without anesthesia, 
you are asking the mother to push for one hour and if it doesn't deliver then you have to think about vaginal delivery. Now these are the prerequisites we go through all the time with the trainees and say head should be one fifth palpable. One should add here must have a just an idea about the size of the baby as well. This is quite crucial when it comes to mid pelvic cavity delivery especially in occipital transverse and posterior because the size of the baby is big and if it is you are going to do a rotational delivery then shoulder dystocia is a possibility and subsequently postpartum hemorrhage is a possibility and with occipital posterior if you do a direct occipital posterior delivery third degree tears are a possibility. So one has to think about abdominal palpation and also consider the size of the baby. Vaginally it's vertex, cervix fully dilated, exact position of the head should be known, idea about caput and molding and pelvis should be known to be adequate just by feeling for the sacral promontory, the skill spine, sacral spinous ligament uh, and so forth. And there should be a clear explanation to the mother as to what you are trying to do and why you are going to do this instrumental delivery. Appropriate analgesia, the minimum should be pudendal block but if it is mid pelvic cavity, appropriate analgesia should be regional block if possible. It's not always possible uh, but the minimum should be perineal infiltration and pudendal block. Maternal bladder should be empty. Then the operator should have enough knowledge and skills and if the person is in training, then a senior person should be by the side till such time they assess the junior person to be competent in doing that. And adequate facilities are available like good lighting and uh, backup plan if there is a problem to failure to deliver, especially if it is mid-cavity forceps and the senior obstetrician should be there. And one must anticipate complications with instrumental delivery as I mentioned shoulder dystocia, postpartum hemorrhage, and uh, the personal per person should be include also the pediatrician or the neonatologist. Consent, by and large in the UK, we do it by verbal consent, if it is an outlet or a low forceps, because we know it's going to be accomplishing a normal delivery. But if it's a mid-cavity or a trial of forceps delivery in the operating theater, it is better to get a consent where it says, operative vaginal delivery slash cesarean section. So you don't have to go back again uh, to get another consent and operative cesarean section needs written consent. Now we go back to the assessment, fetal condition, which includes not only the baby's heart rate but also uterine contractions. Because as an operator you will be focusing on the baby, uh, how it is coming down and you might forget altogether what is on the fetal monitor or the contraction. If the contractions are too much, you might want to reduce the oxytocin. If it is not enough, you might want to step up the oxytocin. Caput and molding, descent of the head, position of the head uh, in terms of flexion, size of the pelvis, general feel of the pelvis, and descent with contraction and bearing down effort. That's quite crucial. Now, the best way to assess whether this will come through, it's like a ring and a ball, and if you push the ball and the ball is coming down, that means the baby is going to come down. So when she's having the contraction and pushing, you must do the vaginal examination to see whether it's coming. If it is not moving at all when she's having a contraction and pushing, then the chances are low. The second thing is actually, if they can feel the baby's ear in occipital transverse or posterior position, that means the baby's head is low down. Now these are the heart rate patterns which are of concern. Prolonged bradycardia in the second stage, you had to apply the forceps. And the prolonged deep deceleration, which I mentioned yesterday as subacute hypoxia, where the deceleration comes to less than 80 beats and lasts for 90 seconds and goes to the baseline only for 30 seconds. These decelerations are common in the second stage because there could be an occult cord compression, a knuckle of cord going between the head and the uh, pelvis. And the deceleration pattern with loss of baseline variability. So if the trace shows in between deceleration, there's loss of variability, or there is a sudden rise or sudden bradycardia, then this has to be uh, carefully watched. So the rising baseline rate is also not good. Falling baseline is also not good. If you do it for fetal distress or fetal compromise, it's always good to do a cord arterial blood gas and Abgauss go very carefully. So essentials for instrumental delivery is better to have an IV line 
And we keep a 14 and 16 gauge cannula, which is actually orange.